Pine Church family. Thank you so much for being with us in worship today. There's a couple exciting things coming up that we just wanted to let you know about. So birth through preschool classes are resuming July 19th, and we're so excited about this. You can find details and guidelines for this on the website, in the newsletter, or on Facebook. Also this Friday, Ladies Night at the Esquire is happening. We're gonna be showing the movie, I Still Believe. Doors are opening at 6.30 and the movie starts at seven. It's first come, first serve, and space is limited due to physical distancing, so show up early. Thank you for joining us this morning, whether you're online, on the radio, or in person. Have a great day. Good morning. Welcome to First Baptist. We are so glad you're here today. Let's begin uh, by reading from God's Word, John 4, 19 through 26. I love this powerful conversation between Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus declared, Believe me, woman, a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know the Messiah called Christ is coming. When he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared, I who speak to you am he. Let's stand together, and we're going to sing Jesus Messiah.
I, before we sing this next song, I want to tell you something. I recently had a good conversation with a member of our congregation, and we discussed how a familiar song can sometimes lose its meaning uh, to us. You can sing it uh, almost without thinking about it. Uh, you can go through the motions and almost miss it. So uh, we're going to continue our worship by singing Amazing Grace, one of the most familiar songs of all time. And I want you to sing it like you're singing it for the first time, just considering the words in a new way. Sing it as a personal testimony of God's saving grace in your life. Let's sing together. Thank you. You may be seated. In the spirit of that grace, we come to pray. So for those of us that are in the auditorium, for those who are worshiping um, on live streaming or listening on the radio, we now come to that part in our service where we ask for God's grace in what we've brought into worship with us today. Those pressures, those stresses... 
those things that are pushing in on your heart and your soul, now is the time where we're going to ask God to apply his grace to those things. So I want to ask you to bow with me as we pray. As we begin to pray, thank him for the grace who sa that saved you, for the Lord Jesus Christ. Your grace is so amazing, Lord. Far be it from us, Lord, to make it like just it's a normal thing, Lord. It is so otherworldly, and yet we get to experience it. Thank you, Lord, for rescuing us, for coming to look for us, for taking the initiative, for letting us find you, for your forgiveness, your peace, and your hope that is ours because we've surrendered, God, our will to yours. And as we come in singing songs about who Jesus is and what you've done for us, Lord, we thank you for the gospel, for the good news, Lord, that we sing and we proclaim, and, Lord, that we breathe. It's how we live. Lord, you know our hearts this morning better than anyone who can see us Lord, you know what we're really dealing with. Father, we pray that your grace might be applied to those situations. That your grace might give us strength. That it might give us patience. That it might give us long-suffering. Lord, that it might enable us to have a perspective that is beyond just this present moment. So we thank you for your saving grace, Father, and your strengthening grace. And Lord, in the midst of things that are really challenging right now, we pray that your sustaining grace would hold us. Lord, you know about relationships that are straining. You know about situations. Lord, you know how we've contributed to those problems. Lord, we pray that you would continue to teach us from your word about loving people and solving problems. We pray that you would give us a grace to give to other people. Lord, this morning as we worship, we thank you for welcoming us into your presence. We know it's not something that we've earned, but it's certainly a privilege that we enjoy. So please receive our praise Lord, please inhabit it, Lord. May it be honoring to you, pleasing to you. Open our hearts as we hear your word read to us, Lord. These are the words of life. These words read us. Our focus scripture this morning comes from Acts chapter 8. I'll be reading verses 26 through 40. Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So he started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. This man had gone to Jerusalem to worship, and on his way home was sitting in his chariot reading the book of Isaiah the prophet. The spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. Then Philip ran up to the chariot and heard the man reading Isaiah the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. The eunuch was reading this passage of scripture. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? For his life was taken from the earth. The eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? 
Then Philip began with that very passage of scripture and told him the good news about Jesus. As they traveled along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here is water. Why shouldn't I be baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot. Then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away, and the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. Philip, however, appeared at Azotus and traveled about, preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. Let's continue our worship by standing together and singing a profession of our faith. This I believe. Let's open up our Bibles to Acts chapter 8 together. Continuing our series through these episodes in Acts that help us to look about how we can learn some lessons on diversity and ministry for the 21st century um, church, from the first century church. Talking about Philip today. This is not Philip who was one of the 12, but Philip 
who was one of the seven. Last week, we saw him um, waiting tables um, at the, for the Grecian widows and loving people and solving problems. That's what we found him doing. Today, Acts 8 tells us another time when the church was shaken and ended up being sent. Acts 8 declares that after Stephen's stoning, Stephen was one of the seven too, you remember, and chapter 7 tells us that he preached a magnificent sermon that pointed to Jesus being the Messiah. And in being the Messiah, he began to show from the Old Testament why this was true. And for his good sermon, they stoned him that day. And after his death, a great persecution arose in Jerusalem, and the early church was dispersed and scattered away from Jerusalem. So Philip and his family fled to a city in Samaria, we're told, in the early part of Acts chapter 8, where they began sharing the gospel with Samaritans. And today, I hope that as we think about how these shaken days that we live in, these ongoing pandemic days, that any time that God allows his people to be shaken and sifted, that his purpose is in sending them to accomplish the purpose that they were given to begin with. In Acts chapter 1, we read in verse 8 that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the world. And that is what takes place in Acts 8. You know, not only is it possible to get comfortable with singing wonderful words from a hymn, but it's comfortable, it's easy just to get comfortable in anything that we do. In these days, though, comfort seems to be lacking. I hear people often these days talking about when it gets back to normal, when things get back to normal. I don't know what things will look like in the future, and I don't know if it will be normal or not. I just don't. I don't have a word from the Lord about that. But all I know is that things are disnormal or unnormal. They're not like they usually are. However you'd like to say that. I want us to see that in times like that, God wants to use us. And God wants to send us. And God wants us to see how his spirit will break down barriers for us in getting people the gospel. Philip's story is an example of that. I want you to see that Philip was already engaged in ministry. And God has a tendency to use people who are already engaged in ministry to do other things for him. We find this in verse 4 of chapter 8. If you'll look towards the beginning of the chapter, um, Luke tells us that on that great day, persecution broke out against the church at Jerusalem. And all except the apostles were scattered throughout Judea and Samaria. That's in verse 1. Godly men buried Stephen and Saul, a young Pharisee in training, began to destroy the church, going house to house, dragging men off and women and putting them in prison. Those who had been dispersed or scattered, verse 4 says, preached the word wherever they went. They shared the good news about Jesus and about what God was doing for us in Christ. Verse 5 says, Philip went down to a city in Samaria and proclaimed the Christ there. And when the crowds heard Philip and saw the miraculous signs he did, they all paid close attention to what he said. With shrieks, evil spirits came out of many, and many paralytics and cripples were healed. So there was great joy in that city. Let your eyes go down to verse 12 um, as well. Um, it, it says, but when they believed Philip as he preached the good news of the kingdom and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and Women. We'll not read the part about Simon the sorcerer here. You can read that at your leisure if you'd like. I want you to see that Philip was already engaged in a really good work in chapter 8 in Samaria after he left Jerusalem. We know he'd been waiting tables. We know he'd been taking care of Grecian widows. Philip was, was doing menial labor, but Philip was available to the Lord to do much more. And as they left Jerusalem... Philip began to do that much more that he could. You see, God looks for ready and available people for ministry opportunities. People who are already engaged, 
somehow seem to find and hear God's voice leading them to the next thing. Philip was loving people and solving problems as a table waiter, but we find out that Philip is a tremendous evangelist. He heals people just like the apostles do. He he facilitates exorcisms. He preaches the good news. People are saved, are baptized. Philip is a part of bringing great joy to this this Samaritan village or city that he was a part of. Philip was displaced from what was comfortable. Jerusalem was a comfortable ministry, but he was displaced and dispersed from that. Brothers and sisters, if you've gotten comfortable in this uncomfortable time, I'm here to shake that up today. And I'm here to ask you to get involved and get engaged in ways that we can instead of the ways that we used to be able to do that. God tends to use people who flex and adapt and who move forward anyway. I I hear stories recently about people who are digging their heels in about some things. They're not going to do this or do that. They're going to do things their own way like they used to do. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you to tell you right now, in the kingdom of God, in God's economy of things, when he shakes things up, it's so that we will flex and adapt and do what we can instead of what we used to do. That's what Philip was doing. Philip was, I like to say, making good lemonade out of the lemons that he was given. He took the hand that he was dealt, and he started there. Now, one of the things we haven't said yet is that the Jews hated Samaritans. They thought that they were half-breeds, ethnically and religiously. The Samaritans um, were part of the lost ten tribes of the northern tribes. They had intermarried with Assyrians in the 8th century. And there was just a division and a divide between the Jews and the Samaritans. We know those stories from Jesus in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well. Um, In Luke 17, one of the lepers that was healed was a Samaritan and came back and said thank you to Jesus. We also know that Jesus made the hero of a story of a man who helped a man when other religious people wouldn't, that he made him the hero of the Good Samaritan story. Philip left Jerusalem and started sharing Jesus as he went to this next place. He was willing to break down and disregard the racial prejudice of the Jewish people and go to people who were far from God and needed the good news in their life. He was doing a good work in Samaria, but God reassigned him. Philip's heart was this, and it reminds me of the words of Samuel. Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. Speak, Lord, for your servant listens. I wonder if that's your prayer in these pandemic days. In fact, I want to ask you in the middle of my sermon just to bow your heads And just to pray that prayer. I I want you to be in a place where the Lord can disrupt you. Maybe even disperse you. To go and to do what he has for you. Father, speak. Your servants are listening. Father, speak. Your people saved by your grace are listening. Help us as we learn from Philip this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. God has a tendency to look for whenever, wherever, and however people. A divine messenger comes to Philip. He's doing a good work in Samaria. In fact, it was so good and things were blowing up so much that the apostles in Jerusalem had heard what was going on in Samaria. So they sent Peter and James to check it out. And when Peter and James came, they found that the people had encountered the same God that they had and had received the same grace. And so they prayed and the Holy Spirit came on them and they noticed that God was doing a great work among the Samaritans there. Verse 25 says, 
When they had testified and proclaimed the word of the Lord, Peter and John returned to Jerusalem preaching the gospel in many Samaritan villages. And it occurred to me that Peter and John were already going south on the day that God asked Philip to go south to the Gaza Road. Why couldn't he just send the apostles? They were going south. They were going home. They could have caught up with the Ethiopian just as easy as Philip. Why did God want Philip to go? Because it was Philip's work, not Peter and John's work. It was what God had for Philip, not for Peter and John. So a divine messenger directs Philip. Notice Philip's heart here. Verse 27 says, so he started out and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch. Philip is open and immediately responds obediently. Man, God, I'm doing a good work in Samaria. Good for you. Go down to the Gaza road, the desert road. I I want you to see several things that the Spirit does to empower us to overcome the gospel barriers that we sometimes um, find. First, let's notice that ethnically, Philip was Greek. He was a Jew from a Greek background, and this Ethiopian is African. So we have somebody who has some roots in in, uh, Jewish background as well as in European background, and someone who is African. That's a barrier. It can be a barrier. It doesn't have to be, but it could have been. Notice there was also a personal barrier. The Ethiopian is called a eunuch. That's not a word we're going around saying all the time. We don't know if he was a eunuch from birth, if he was born this way. We don't know if he made himself this way or if he was made this way because of the role that he was playing. It meant that he was castrated. He was not able to bear children. And Philip, we know from Acts 21, had four daughters, and they were called prophetesses. Prophetesses. They were called prophetess. They would speak on behalf of God when he would lead them to speak. You know, sometimes infertility can be a, a barrier. It can be a very difficult thing for families to deal with. I don't know about this Ethiopian's life. It may have been something that he had accepted and gone on. It was a part of who he was. But that's a difference between these two men. Did you also notice that Philip was walking? Did you notice this? Philip is walking to the Gaza road. And at one point, he's running to catch up to a chariot. When I was a kid and I wanted to go somewhere, sometimes my dad would say, take Mike and Ike and take a hike. And that's what Philip was doing. Philip was taking Mike and Ike and taking a hike. But the Ethiopian eunuch, what was he doing? He was riding. Nice chariot. In fact, the word here means a covered wagon-ish. Not not 17th, 18th century covered wagon for us. Very nice covered wagon. So nice that he could hold a scroll and read while he was being driven. Now, as a kid from Detroit, I like to think that he was in a Cadillac. That's what I think when I read this. There was a financial difference between these two men. There was a linguistic difference as well. You know, before I move on, I mentioned the scroll. To to have your own scroll of Isaiah, 66 chapters of the book of Isaiah, it would have been a mammoth scroll to be able to hold. It would have cost a great amount of money. There was a linguistic barrier as well. Language challenges require interpretation and an explanation. Both of these men seem to be multilingual as well. Most likely he was reading um, a Greek version of the Old Testament that we call the Septuagint. This quotation that's in 30, verse 32 and 33 um, is exactly represented in the Greek version of the Old Testament. So it's likely a Greek text he was reading and not a Hebrew text at the time. Well, isn't that interesting that God would send a Greek to talk to somebody who's reading from the Greek version of the Old Testament. So when Philip gets up, when he catches up, (laughs) hey, you understand what you're reading? Somehow we don't think that Philip's out of breath here, you know. But he's running to something that is rolling. Not many of us could do that very long before we started huffing and puffing either. There's a vocational difference here, isn't there? The Ethiopian is the queen's treasurer and her servant. He watches over all the financial needs of their kingdom. Philip is a recent table waiter turned evangelist, 
on a knight's errand from the king himself. There were lots of things keeping these two men apart. But when Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? This man, because he had been to Jerusalem in worship, he had been seeking God. He wanted to know the answer to a question. How can I unless someone explains it to me, verse 31 said. And so he invites Philip to come up and to sit with him. I'm sure Philip was glad to catch a ride. There was a vocational difference between these two men. And there was also a spiritual difference. This Ethiopian was a Gentile. He may have been a God-fearer. He was a seeker. But Philip knows Jesus. And that's what makes all the difference here in this conversation. God tends to use people who are, who are willing to break away from comfortable old patterns and be able to break into new, even going places where we're not sure what's going to happen when we get there. These days, people are looking for a lot of reassurance. And it can be false assurance that we can give them if we say too much or if we say more than what we know to be true. Brothers and sisters, some of this unknowingness keeps us in desperate prayer to be useful for God's kingdom's work in our time. That's what Philip was doing, saying yes to God with what he had. When we next find Philip, we'll see that he's in Caesarea, like the end of the chapter says. You heard Brett read it there. We'll find Philip in Caesarea. And next week, when we look at Peter and a man named Cornelius, God sends Peter to Cornelius in Caesarea, even though Philip is there. Why would he send Peter from Jerusalem to Caesarea when Philip is already there? How come Philip couldn't go talk to the, Caesarea, the, the, the Cornelius in Caesarea? Because it was Peter's assignment, not Philip's. Brothers and sisters, in these days, speak. Ask the Lord to speak to you. Ask the Lord to move you out of whatever comfort zone that you've gotten into during these pandemic days and ask God to wake you up to what his spirit might want you to do in getting the good news to someone who needs it. Be, be available to that. I want to ask you to consider three action steps and I'll be done. The, the first is this, is to check your default setting. And by that I mean simply, is your heart and mind ready to obey and go. See, if you are only willing to go if it meets your certain circumstances, that may limit your ability to say yes to God. But when you pray a prayer like Samuel did, you might be surprised what the Lord might lead you to. Check your default setting. The second one is this, get active in ministry. Be busy about serving someone in Jesus' name. Somehow, somewhere, be about serving someone in Jesus' name. That's what Philip was doing. And then finally, show someone the way. Tell the good news about Jesus to someone. Did you notice um, early on in verse 8 where Philip was ministering, there was great joy in the city when he was sharing the gospel when Philip is transported away, um, maybe the first Star Trek moment mentioned in Scripture here, when he was transported, teleported to wherever the Lord took him. That, but the eunuch didn't see him again, but he went on his way rejoicing. One of the marks that happens amongst believers is when we're sharing the good news and seeing kingdom work going on, is that there's great joy among us. You can't manufacture it. The ability to know that God's in control and God's working things out and we're just doing the next thing that the Lord gives us to do together. These are just some of the lessons of diversity in ministry that I see for us in the first, in, from the first century church to the 21st century church. I know there are barriers. I know that our culture is throwing up some barriers, but I want you to know that gospel advance for the kingdom of God can break through those barriers. And we are just the people that God wants to use to make that happen.
God is no respecter of persons. He shows no favorites whatsoever. What God has done in using Philip, he can use us. Get busy serving somebody in Jesus' name. Stop waiting for people to serve you in Jesus' name. All of us can have a part and a role in doing kingdom work together. Let's look for ways that we can say yes to the Lord as we listen to him. Let's pray together. Lord, I pray that we might know the joy that obedience brings and that we might be people with a mindset to be open and immediately obedient when we sense you moving us across some barriers to share the good news. Lord, I pray that you would bring some folks our way and across our paths this week so that we could serve you in your purposes. Lord, it's a shaken time in our culture. Lord, and you're sifting us to see if we'll just go about like things are normal, doing business as normal, or if you, Lord, will find people who are willing and available. Lord, we pray that you might make us whenever, wherever, and however people. Father, would you forgive us for being too set in our ways, for, being long, for longing for the good old days. And Lord, help us to live in this moment this now and help us to look for how you're sending us to people who are far from you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you were willing to do for one man who had come from a faraway country. Thank you that you were willing to interrupt Philip and that he was interruptible so that he could be sent for this good work. Lord, send us to do the same. We want to be useful and helpful in your kingdom's work for your purposes and glory. Thank you, Lord, for sending the suffering servant, the Lord Jesus, the one you promised to us in Isaiah 53. Thank you that Jesus left heaven's glory, the riches of heaven, and came and took on the role of a servant. Help us to follow in his footsteps, to serve you and your purposes in our time. We thank you, Lord, for your word. Your word is truth. Lord, we want to see, Lord, your word at work in our lives. Holy Spirit, make it so for your honor and for your glory, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Let's stand. Let's sing together. And as you hear one another sing about the greatness and goodness of our God, let's rejoice together in the good news of the gospel. Let's sing together. Who can satisfy?
Thank you for being here this morning. It's a blessing to be together. It's one that uh, I don't take for granted, and it's just a, a blessing to be together, sing together, pray together, and hear a great message. If you came this morning intending to worship through giving, there are a couple of ways you can do that. There are buckets on the way out. You can drop it right in the bucket. There are also some ways up on the screen behind me. You can give online through text, um, bring it to the office. So lots of ways you can worship through giving. Um, I'm going to pray in a minute, and we will be dismissed. And I would just ask, we're, we're growing in this service. We have more people this morning. So if we could just maybe dismiss in a little bit, um, in an orderly way, let the people behind you go first. So if you're in the middle, especially in the front, just give the people behind you a few minutes to go to the back and exit that way. Thanks for being here. I'll pray and we'll be dismissed. Father, we do love you. Thank you for the reminder this morning that people matter. And a reminder that no matter what's going on in the world, that um, we can have open hearts and open eyes and still have open doors to make a difference in the life of people around us. Help us, Lord not be praying so much about things getting back to the way they were, but how you want to use us in the lives of others. And you can love on people in our sphere through us, and we could have attentive hearts. Help, help me do a better job of that, Lord. Thank you again uh, for Billy and his message and all that goes into planning this service. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. I feel like a I feel like a NASCAR driver.